Great pleasure to be chairing this panel discussion. And the focus of this session is really to try and identify steps that should be taken to improve equity in health, including in relation to the to the determinants and the prevention of um, of health in Australia. And, and it's a wonderful um, to have four really esteemed presenters in this panel discussion, two uh, members of the academy, who you'd be very familiar with. Um, and so what we're going to do is I'll just give a brief introduction to the panel members, and then each of them will give five minutes um, of their thoughts, and then we will be opening up to questions from the audience. Um, I just wanted to make sure that people in the back of the audience can hear. I think there was a little bit of issues yesterday. So if at any stage you find you can't hear, can you please raise your hands. Hands. So um, I want to welcome the panel members. Um, first is Fran Baum, who's the Program Director of the Stretton Health Equity University of Adelaide, and you heard the introduction to Fran and the excellent chairing of the conversation with Sir Michael. The next panel member is um, Sharon Friel, who's also a member of the Academy, and she is um, the an ARC Laureate Fellow and the Professor of Health Equity and Director of the Planetary Health Equity Hothouse and the Australian Research Centre for Health Equity at the Australian National University. Um, Sharon's work focuses on the governance of planetary, social and commercial determinants of health inequities. And she's a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences of Australia and of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences. The third panel member is Dr. Selena Namchi Lowe, who is the Executive Director of the Australian Global Health Alliance. Selena has nearly three decades of experience in global and international health with qualifications in medicine, tropical medicine, and a master's in public and international law. And she's currently consulting editor for Global and Planetary Health Commissions for The Lancet, where she was previously senior editor based in London and Beijing. And Selena's worked in many countries throughout the world, including Afghanistan, Myanmar, China, Thailand, and Bangladesh, and specifically with refugee, stateless, ethnic minority, and IDU and sex worker communities. And the final panel member is Professor Taryn Wimaranthi, who is the president of the Public Health Association of Australia. And Taryn is an adjunct professor in the School of Population and Global Health at the University of Western Australia. And he's also on the governing council of the World Federation of Public Health Association. So Taryn is a trained specialist in international medicine and public health. And he has a PhD in social medicine and he was Chief Health Officer in Western Australia from 2008 to 2018, and also in the Northern Territory from 2004 to 2007. And over the last few years, he's focused on addressing the health impacts of climate change, conducting a statutory inquiry under the Western Australia Public Health Act in 2016, and also on assisting COVID-19 response in various Australian states and nationally, including through major reviews of contact tracing. So you can see we've got quite a diverse panel um, that's set up for you. And the intent is really to provide a broad overview of health equity, the nature of health equities, and really to try and understand what we can do as professionals in our both professional and personal life to try and increase health equity. So I'd invite those people who are online to please submit questions via the webinar. Um, and as I said, what we're going to do now is hand over to each of the speakers. And then after they've given five minutes or so of their views, then we will open up to commentary and questions from the audience. So thank you. So the first the first speaker that I'll ask is Fran, if you could just give an overview. Yeah, well, thank you. And good morning, everybody. Can you hear at the back? Yeah, that's great. And I'd just like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the lands of the Gagara and Turbal people and pay respects to the elders past, present and future and acknowledge their amazing resilience through the processes of colonization. Um, when I think in the interview with Michael, Michael talked a lot about the sort of everyday determinants of health. And we didn't look so much at, well, what's the world in which we're trying to reduce health inequities? And when we look at that world, it's now being described as a world of poly crises. Um, there have been huge environmental factors, which I know Sharon's going to talk about, um, massively growing inequities at the moment, primarily you know, that, that's seen in um, terms of wealth inequities, 
but also in some countries like the US, UK, for some groups, life expectancy now is going backwards for the first time in, um, well, really for the first time since we've kept data. Uh, there's socially, there's isolation, burgeoning rates of mental health. On the political front, there's more and more populist uh, right-wing uh, people in government, but also, as we've seen in the referendum, a whole lot of fake news that, that can travel around social media. And I think that makes it a much harder space to talk about health equity than in the past. And uh, there's some sort of in Australia at the moment, the key things we'd point to would be housing. Everybody points to housing and I get a little bit frustrated by it making it a generational issue because uh, I think it's also a class issue because data in the UK has shown that if you're young and you're in the top 25% uh, of people, you're more likely to own a house than you were, say, 50 years ago. So, you know, it depends who your parents are still. And... Uh, we need to, to bear that in mind that it's it's about everyday living conditions, but it's also about how we distribute wealth and resources. And what we've seen in the last um, three decades is a massive, massive rise of wealth to the top 1% around the world, absolutely massive. And that has all sorts of implications for social cohesion, apart from the level of inequities. So we do need to pay attention to that. The other thing that's becoming increasingly important in this debate are the commercial determinants of health. And uh, Selena, Sharon and I worked on a Lancet series where you can find three papers laying that out. Um, and, and those determinants are important, whether we look at the things that we consume, whether it's gambling, food, alcohol, smoking, so on, but also in the way that those uh, particularly large corporations operate. Um, and the, our research group recently has been looking at the roles of big accounting firms, and we found that there are mo multiple ways in which they affect health and equity in this country. One of the major ones is by um, de-skilling our public sector so they don't have the capacity to plan for equity. Equity only happens if we have a good public sector that can plan for it, can build policies, can implement policies, can see a long-term vision when a lot of government work is outsourced, that just doesn't happen because there's lots of short-term consultancies. The public service itself is losing its capacity and it certainly doesn't have the long-term vision that's needed to do that. Um, and I'll, I'll finish just one more point because I know we've got a discussion after and it's sort of in a way an introduction to Sharon's point. I, I recently wrote a, a, an opinion piece in, in the BMJ pointing out that we're in this situation, and for this academy, I think it's something to think about really seriously, that we're putting all these resources into improving health for a number of diseases that are rarer and rarer, that give us less and less population benefit. Um, and at the same time, we've got a planet that needs our care, you know, that, that's threatening the health of all of us to a much greater degree than COVID has and the existing diseases that we know of. So the question I'd ask to the Academy is, what's our duty to planetary care? Is it enough that we just focus on patient care or do we need to think about planetary care if we want to think about what's really driving both the health of, of our planet and the people on it, but also driving the inequities because the people who are going to be able to transition uh, to a zero carbon community are going to be the people with more resources, more education and better off. So there's a real chance that if we survive the planetary crisis, we'll be, we will come out of it as a much less equal community. So I'll stop on that point now and I'm sure we can revisit Thank some of those Thank you very much. Issues. And that gives us some interesting discussion points, mm -hmm. I think, for later. So over to you, Sharon. Lovely. Well, but you, you think we would have planned that. So perfect segue. Because um, what I am very interested in is that intersection between climate change, inequality and health. Um, what we are referring to as the planetary health equity crisis. So the ability to enjoy equitable, e equitably enjoy health in a stable earth system uh, is very much at risk. Currently we're 1.14 degrees Celsius, uh, mean heating uh, above pre-industrial levels. 
we're on a trajectory to three degrees uh, locked in unless we do something very drastic. And that really matters for our health. As temperatures go up, uh, we know the levels of heat exhaustion, heat stroke, cardiovascular disease and kidney diseases are going up. Uh, the temp rising temperatures uh, are worse for air pollution. Dirtier air is linked to higher hospital admissions and death rates for asthmatics and people suffering from cardiac uh, and pulmonary diseases. As the land and the sea go through rapid changes, the animals that inhabit them uh, are going to die out if they don't adapt really quickly. Uh, and why does that matter for health? Because if pollinators disappear, then we have a global food security crisis. Flood and disasters that we've seen and we know that leave communities highly vulnerable uh, to anxiety, to post-traumatic stress disorders, as well as mosquito-borne diseases. So these, and, and there, I, I could go on, I, I hate starting with these types of uh, illustrations of that relationship because it's horrific and it's getting worse. And we are all being affected uh, by these climate uh, impacts. But of course, it is very, very unequally caused and very unequally experienced. And what we'll see is a tsunami of health inequities as a consequence. So people who are poor, uh, the elderly, people with disabilities, people who are already socially marginalized are the least able to adapt to these uh, changing climate situations. They are the ones who are least able to escape from the floods, the fires, uh, the heat, who are most likely to live in dwellings and have working conditions that put them already at more uh, risk. And so what climate change will do, and the way that Michael spoke about the plague, uh, revealing and amplifying health inequities, climate change is already doing that right now. And we've seen it in Australia. I'll give the illustration from Lismore. In 2022, 82% of the population's living in Lismore, the flood areas, uh, were those who were most socially disadvantaged already. Back in 2017, the Northern River floods, including uh, Lismore, it was exactly the same situation. And between 2017 and 2022, nothing changed in those social conditions that we've been speaking about already. So we had an absolute failure of climate change adaptation and a very inequitable climate change adaptation. And so we could just keep thinking about adaptation. We could just keep thinking climate change adaptation. We could just keep thinking about treating people, helping people in response to these climate effects. And that's vitally important. That's what adaptation is all about. Or, and, we could mitigate further climate change. And I would argue that mitigation is perhaps the biggest preventative health action that we can take. It has to be equity focused, but it is one, it is, I think, the biggest preventative health measure. And what that means is addressing what we are referring to as the consumptogenic system. The system of policies, of institutions, of commercial activities, uh, of societal and institutional norms that absolutely incentivize, reward, lock in the excessive production and consumption of fossil fuel goods and services that, of course, are incredibly harmful for the environment, but they're also often very bad for human health and they are very unequally distributed and valued. This is a structural issue. The agency aspect that Michael uh, was speaking about is vitally important, particularly uh, when it comes to adaptation, but we must do something about the structural drivers of planetary health inequity. And that takes us to questions of governance. To transform that consumptogenic system towards a system that prioritizes planetary health equity goals means intersectoral policy, mitigation policy, 
that optimises social and health goals. It means an economic growth model that really embraces planet, health, social. So the wellbeing economy discourse that's happening at the moment offers great potential. In Australia, we, we've done some analysis recently through the hothouse that's looking, that looked at the Australian economic growth model. It's a domestic consumption model, and it's driven by two things, housing and credit uh, market availability. And would any political party in this country take it on? Not a chance, uh, because we all are benefiting from that. But if we're going to do anything about the biggest preventative health uh, intervention that exists, i.e. climate change mitigation, we have to. We've got to address the housing system uh, and we have to address uh, the credit system. Why are we not touching these sorts of things? Well, it's because of power and power inequities. The consumptogenic system is full of vested interests. It's full of those corporate interests that absolutely benefit from it. And it's full of the conservative elites who want to tinker uh, at the edges. They're working very hard to control the narrative. So it's all about individual responsibility, switch off the lights, go and get an electric car. And I'm not suggesting that that's not important, but it's woefully inadequate. Uh, they're also setting the rules of the game in which we are all operating and think it's absolutely the norm. Uh, and in doing so, under, underwriting the political uh, environment. The Secretary General from the United Nations noted wealthy economies, i.e. countries like Australia uh, and corporations, are not just turning a blind eye. They are adding fuel to the flames. They are choking our planet based on their vested interests and historical investments in fossil fuels. For the Australian government to want to do anything about planetary health equity, we must stop subsidising fossil fuel projects in this country. And that would save us money because we are sub as a government, we are subsidising uh, these, uh, these activities. So it's actually really cheap. So for us in this room, if we think that health equity matters and we recognise that climate change is a vital part uh, and a key part for that, we, we must be lending a voice into things like the wellbeing economy discussions into the national climate and health strategy, which at the moment is focusing on healthcare systems that matters. It's not enough at all. Climate change mitigation is the biggest preventative health intervention that we can take, and it must be done equitably. Thank you. Thank you. And I think um, the point of Yeah, the, the point of um, intergenerational perspectives and thoughts on yeah. that, I think, is something we will address later during the discussion if we can. But, Selena, can you just provide your thoughts on Thanks very much. Um, so thank you for having me. And um, my qualifier is I'm not an expert in anything. What I do is I facilitate the work um, of experts um, to have greater impact, either through publishing or um, through my role at the Australian Global Health Alliance, which is a national peak body in global health. So when we talk about global health, often what I found when I've traveled around Australia is that um, students and um, individuals think about it as work that we do over there. So international development aid, and certainly that's where I started my work in global health, which was then international health. But it's actually about health equity and I really um, welcome this opportunity um, to speak here. Global health is about all of us, not some of us. I think that's the easiest definition of it. And if you ask me the question, why should I bother as a scientist about global health in the face of an erupting full-scale war in Israel, Gaza, in the face of earthquake in Afghanistan, um, where many people have lost lives and home. This is happening this week now. now. Um, in the face of the climate crisis, as um, Sharon eloquently put out. I don't know. Um, the pandemic showed that um, uh, all our global health governance mechanisms, all of the investments that our member states have put into global health actually failed um, when the test was put in terms of access to vaccines, initial treatments to countries. 
So that starts this discussion off quite negatively. But the um, the summary that um, Sir Michael Marmot put out in terms of the determinants of health is really what global health is about. We work on addressing the determinants of health. And in my next four minutes, I want to cover how and also what you know we should be doing um, in our little way um, um, from this part of the world. In my view, the determinants of health, no matter how um, we look at it in terms of the, um, the most important global health challenges for us to face, this is just my view. I've cut it into three ways. Planetary health, I think they, it's the most um, important challenge to our human civilization. And that's the health of the human civilization and the natural world on which it depends, not just human health, but our human civilization, all that that means, our cultures, our political systems, our economic systems. And that was a challenge from the Lancet Medical Journal and um, the Rockefeller Center when they put that uh, first report out and has um, um, gone on, as um, Michael Marmot said, about the social determinants beyond our dreams in terms of um, interest. Secondly, gender equality. There is no sustainable development going to happen without gender equality. And it's not just about women. It's actually also about LGBTIQ plus communities who are increasingly attacked across the globe with hate bills and discrimination bills. We should have something to say about this um, as a scientific community. And thirdly, I'm gonna put it out there, although I understand that um, a previous speaker has racism. Um, we're going to um, vote um, this Saturday, uh, this week, um, several members of the Global Health Alliance and indigenous leads of this country uh, wrote in the Lancet Global Health a comment that I would encourage you to read about why a voice, um, yes, a pathway would be good um, for global health overall, not just in Australia, but also globally. And um, I would like to flip the discourse on racism to a more positive summary of the three um, areas that I've just put out. It's actually about cherishing diversity, whether it's planetary diversity and our natural systems and the possibility of plants that can be used to treat us in the future and keep our human lives continuing, whether it's diversity in our gender and sexuality or whether it's diversity um, in our ethnic makeup and geographical and cultural um, linguistic um, background. So what needs to happen really is that, as Sharon said, it's a power shift. Those of us with power, and I include myself in that, um, we need to yield our power when we can. And we need to allow the next generation and people without power to wield their power. What does that mean? It means really simple things like panels. It means um, who gets um, published um, and, and when and how and on what. But it also means in terms of our governance structures, how can we reshape this? And there are many people around the world working on this. There is an area of global health that is increasing, that Fran has been, and, and um, Sharon have been long been um, working in, which is decolonization of global health, quite a confronting word. But in fact, all it means is an equalization of power. Um, and in terms of the how, well, I work two jobs. I work at The Lancet as an ongoing editor, and I can only give an example of my experience there that The Lancet has in recent years looked at its own um, colonialist history like many other institutes are looking into that, not as a virtue signaling, but actually as a baseline, which I know you understand as scientists, to see where we can go next. And the where they're, they're going next is um, they've set up a racial equalities committee within the Lancet. It's an internal mechanism, but you can contribute to it, but also signed up to um, uh, publishing agreements that if we're going to write and publish about countries, in global health, that authorship should also come from those countries. And we need to be fair about that, no matter how the PI is decided and the funding. So in terms of how, I was told by a very eminent scientist when I moved back here six years ago, I won't name him, but he discovered Ebola, um, that um, you can't do global health in Australia, Selena. It's just too far. And I said, too far from what? Too far from your nexus of global health. and. I now work for the Australian Global Health Alliance. Um, we are a national peak body of very diverse members, colleges, um, other memberships such as yourselves, 
but also NGOs. And we're focused on strengthening the ecosystem. But the interesting thing about this alliance, which I didn't know when I joined, because it was actually not, not on the website, that it was actually founded and it, um, by a number of um, entities in Melbourne. Now it's national, but the founding conceptualization was made by Professor Ian Anderson, a Palawa man, who was then responsible for um, Pro Vice Chancellor in, in Education and Research at the University of Melbourne. And he wrote in the um, founding document that um, this alliance was going to be focused on First Nations global health globally. And we've stayed true to that. That's in our current strategy. Um, we're focused on, at the moment, climate change and gender health equity. Um, we do this by advocating um, collectively with our members, by convening um, and by offering strategic partnerships. I don't think it's perfect, but I'm um, you know, really proud of um, the unique way that perhaps Australia can contribute to the global health um, challenges. And so um, I, um, you know, I really invite you, if you're interested in global health, whether as a student or as a fellow, or as an entity and institute um, to come and join us. You don't have to give us membership money. Uh, it's not always um, you know, about um, business case. It's actually about forming a community. And we're building partnerships with government, with private sector, and with the arts. We've got a film festival starting next week. Um, we've just set up a parliamentary Friends of Global Health. And um, I think um, that's my open invitation and I'll stop there. Thank you. Aaron, your thoughts, please. Uh, thanks very much, Denise. Um, first of all, I just want to um, um, express my thanks for the gracious welcome to country we've been afforded. So it's important for me as a visitor here and also thank the conference organising committee for asking me to speak. Um, I've already learned more in the last couple of days just from the nature of the discussions here. Um, and so anything I offer this morning is, is kind of as part of a continuing discussion, thoughts I have with myself and with others, and as many old friends and colleagues here. Um, and I think it's really important that we have these kinds of in-depth discussions, because it's not easy, and in a sense, we're all conflicted. And I certainly feel conflicted and torn by these kinds of discussions. Um, so what I'm gonna attempt is a critique of professionalism. And in, in doing that, we are all professionals. So you're critiquing, critiquing yourself and the systems that we work in, as well as others in the world. And so um, it's difficult to, to do this. But in fact, the, the point I'm gonna to try to make is that unless we do that critique of professionalism and see ourselves as part of the problem, as well as the solution, we can't actually make significant progress. And it's quite liberating once you see yourself as part of the problem. It opens up opportunities to do things differently. So it's actually a hopeful message, not a um, one to kind of just fill you with um, angst, et cetera. I'm sure you've got enough of that to begin with um, because the kinds of people who are here today are the kinds of people who potentially don't need to hear this panel. So there's always a selection um, bias that we, that we um, are faced with. Having said that, it would be wrong to say that as a result of you being those kind of people, you are somehow exempted from your wider professional and personal networks, et cetera. That would be the same, you know, whatever, whatever the result of the referendum this weekend, we are all responsible for the outcome, regardless of which way we voted, just as we are all responsible for the government we elect, regardless of which way we voted, because we are part of a society and you can't step away from it and say, well, I didn't vote for this government, therefore I'm not part of, of what's happening in Australia at the moment. Okay, so that's, so that, that's a, I think it's an important point. The paradox is the very things that makes you terrific and eminent scientists is an ability to step away from a problem or step above a problem, see it differently. And in a sense, abstract yourself from what you're looking at and then describe it, work through it, et cetera, and come up with some new theories and 
I'm surrounded here by people who have made substantial contributions to theoretical advances. Um, and that's very important to be able to do that. But it doesn't mean you're not part of the system you've just described. And when David introduced the theme yesterday of driving health equity, I thought, hang on a sec. If I took, if I, we want to get some handle on equity, but let me just think about driving for a second. And it's easier to think through driving because there will be people here who have worked on road safety. Okay, so let's, and you know that it's about safe driving and drivers, it's about safe cars, it's about safer roads, it's about the culture of driving, it's about enforcement, etc. okay? And you can create a very understandable framework for road safety in Australia, which is useful, okay? And that's part of what we should be doing. But the very moment you've created that as a researcher, academic, scientist, you can't say you are immediately part of that as well because we're also people who drive cars or not, or we have family, we are part of the society we're describing. So when we go out and we park, you know, drive a car or whatever, or a passenger, we, we have an experience that also informs the development of that framework. Okay, we're not separate from it. We are part of what the world in which, that a part of the world we are describing. And I think that's really, really useful because that then helps us continue to develop and understand the frameworks we've constructed. So how does that help? I'm going to just quickly draw on a couple of things. First of all, my experience, um, early experience working in Aboriginal health and my latter experience working in climate action following the Climate Health WA inquiry a few years ago. My first experience with, with this academy was Actually, on invitation of Fran and her co-chairs, this academy put together a working group to develop a position paper on climate action, which is very good and worth reading, and positions the academy to, to have this conversation. Um, but the um, some of one of the less I worked in Aboriginal mortality in the Northern Territory in the early 90s, and there wasn't much being written about it at the time. Few papers. Well, we put together the first kind of coherent body of work on premature adult Aboriginal mortality in, over that period. So having worked in that um, area for a, a long period and have thought you know, about the ethics and the equity issues quite substantially, it was still hard to get traction, I felt, around this major issue. And we go to conferences, College of Physicians, et cetera, et cetera, and you're still kind of on the margin as a kind of a marginal topic. Fast forward to 2007, and it, um, yeah, I had no part in it, but suddenly this new movement came around closing the gap. And I just want to say how important that narrative shift was to close the gap. And I remember thinking, wow, that's suddenly taken all of this work and turned it into, not into you know, an Aboriginal-owned concept around actually doing something about it and closing that gap. So I think that's very positive. Of course, it doesn't magically sh change the world, but it tells you what you're trying to do. And I think that's important. And there are, it makes me think, for me, the word close the gap is an easier way to talk about equity than talking in, in more abstract terms, you know, which is fine. And that does a hell of a lot of useful material. Because what you can do in, in a kind of day-to-day -day discussion around closing the gap is focus on what actually the gap is. And the gap isn't just a gap in health outcomes. It's also a gap between our words and our actions. Okay, It's a gap you know, between um, our personal lives and our professional lives. You know, there's, there's lots of gaps that we know about and talk about. When we did the climate inquiry, we had huge support from health professionals who were saying to us, it was 2019 in WA, we are doing much more at home to um, reduce emissions and address climate change. But when we come into, your, into the health sector, we're not seeing it around us. There's this big gap. And we want to work for organisations that we feel comfortable in. There's a gap here and, you, and we need to close this. So there's all sorts of gaps. Um, so when we... Um, position ourselves 
as pers uh, as citizens, um, professionals, um, employees, and we all have different hats. Um, we need to consider three words, I think, which have already been discussed. So I'm just going to mention what those words are because they're normally invisible. First is history, and it was, this was brought up yesterday. All of us ex are part of professional groups that have a history. So public health has a particular colonial history that I'm more than aware of given the positions I've held um, in, in government in the Northern Territory in Western Australia. So it comes with a baggage. That's the first thing is history. This academy has got little has got less baggage than some of the other professional groups you belong to, but all of them have history. So be aware of it, whether it's your own university or whatever it is. And talking about that history is actually helpful as, as I think we found out yesterday. The second word is power, which we've talked about um, much better and um, through through my colleagues here. And if you, if you just go, oh, I don't think I'm so powerful, just think about your influence as senior scientists. And influence is a form of power. Okay, the fact that you have a say and the people listen to you is a form of power. So whether it's financial power or whatever, it's you have influence. Let's move to the end here, which is the end is, what can you do with this recognition that we're part of the problem? Is you can come up with some newer ways of approaching it. Now, if you asked, what should the academy do? I'd say to you, I have got here lists of things that are already written about what person you can do at a personal, professional, citizen level as an academy, you know, starting with the, you know, decarbonization agenda for yourselves, moving on to advocacy, etc. And there are scorecards that are published that assess professional organizations such as yourselves. And it's against like four criteria. There was an article last year. I can only remember three. It was advocacy, disinvestment, education, and something else. And you know, so you can you can find that in the literature through a Google search if you want to know an agenda for an action. But if you think about just some small things that you could do, which are a bit different, if you saw yourself as part of the problem, um, is you could. Um, look at your collective power as um, high worth individuals in this country. Okay, some of, you know, I'm assuming that there's a fair few people here who are high worth individuals. And I would presume that there's a higher proportion of people in uni super than there are in other superannuation funds, given your backgrounds. And you know what, 15,000 uni super members have put pressure on that super, superannuation organization because of people like yourself to change their investment policies and their divestment policies. And then there are groups such as Market Forces, which publish this, that will Google search last night, took me all of 12 seconds to find out what Market Force position was on Unisuper. By asking the question, by doing those things, you see that you are contributing as a superannuation investor to, to the problem. And there you can ask the question of the system and help shift it. There's many other, there's many other things that we could talk about um, uh, but I'll leave it there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, so that's um really some really powerful information. One of the one of the terms that I um, really resonated in um, St Michael's talk was the term erosion of human dignity. That was very powerful. I think that's something that we really are trying to deal with here. Um, but we're rapidly running out of time for this session, so I want to just encourage the audience to participate. But in the meantime. Just thought that we should go through the panel and can you, building on some of the comments that we've here, what is one action that you think as an organisation that we could do? So the academy is still quite young and small, but realistically to make an important contribution to this issue. What do you think that we as an academy could do? Right. Yeah, I mean, it's hard because the thing with social determinants, they're so broad, but I... The um, my in, in HNMRC investigative fellowship is uh, entitled "Restoring the Fair Go: Building Back Fairer Policies After COVID," and I and in our team we think one sort of policy message 
that we'd love the government to take, given there's talk of having a well-being economy, so on. But actually taking, flattening the gradient in health equity as a measure of national progress. Because that's not, I mean, the social determinants, the commercial determinants are steps on the way to health equity. But that would be saying as a country, we actually have an ambition to achieve a much more equitable society and have it up there as big as GDP. And I think it's a good measure because people are bothered about health. And, you know, if, if we get greater understanding that, you know, things like your employment, your housing, the urban planning of where you live actually reduces your life expectancy. And as a nation, we're going to manage that to, to make that as equal as possible. I think that would be a first step that the academy could take as and then advocate and lobby for that. And one of the things we're trying to do out of our unit is build a coalition of NGOs. To, we, we're calling it the Health Equity Learning Lab to, to develop up the argument for that to put to government. But it would be great if the um, Academy could come on board. Sharon, well, I suspect you've already said what your point was. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, mean, I would say, so ask the government to do their job. Uh, which is about protecting the health uh, and the planet. That's in the rules of being in government. Uh, and I think it's also for the academy, picking up on Taryn's uh, thing of our professional power, is to collectively use our professional power to illustrate that addressing health equity sits across so many different sectors, which is an incredible uh, opportunity. Uh, it's that's not a problem. That's an incredible opportunity for engagement, collaboration as researchers, a whole load of interdisciplinary research opportunities. So I'm going to hand over just to David, who wants to make a point. Well, it was, it's really a, a, a thought bubble. Um, but the, you posed the question, what can the Academy do? And it struck me that last night at dinner, we had a couple of very senior government advisors. Unfortunately, the ministers couldn't be there. Um, but those advisors were extremely impressed by the Academy. And Taran mentioned influence. Um, we can talk to these people. To me, um, you can see that Brisbane's going through a massive redevelopment now with the Olympics, and, and it seems that the government has an appetite for doing the right thing and leaving a legacy. And so, to me, I, now that I've heard about these marmot cities and how that's a practical local governance approach, not all of those things are local government um, responsibilities here, but planting that seed with these influential government advisors through our soft diplomacy of the academy might be one way that we can each do that in our own states and our own cities. So thank you for asking the question and it's got me thinking. Is there any other thoughts from the audience? Otherwise we'll... Russell Gruen from the ACT. Um, what do you think of the idea of marmot communities and could they work in Australia? Fran and, and maybe Sharon. Well, I think I, I'm sure Michael wouldn't wouldn't want to colonise Australia with his name. So we'd have to think, I think, of an a, a suitable of, of Australian name. No, not BAM communities. I was thinking of Benelong communities as one of the very first Indigenous leaders in Sydney. But I'm I'm sure we could think of a First Nations name to represent hell. But it's it's. Well, we've, you know, but there are other WHO initiatives like Healthy Cities, Health in All Policies, all of which kind of build on the idea of using civic pride to, to work. Elizabeth Elliott, a paediatrician from Sydney. I was interested in your point, Sharon, about missed opportunities for prevention. Uh, and you gave the example of the Lismore floods. Similarly, in communities where I work in the Fitzroy Valley, the whole town was devastated. Um, the bridge between Darwin and, and Broome was lost, the bridge between one side of town. Hundreds of houses, you know, virtually all the houses need rebuilding. And these are really missed opportunities, as you say, to put in place the determinants of health that might lead to a better outcome. Can we as a society in any way uh, look at those missed opportunities and perhaps influence government and, and make it clear to them that these are opportunists? for them yeah and and all i would say to your, your example is 
So when those discussions are ongoing, and often it's uh, framed in a kind of a disaster relief or, which is really important, of course, because right at that point in time, that's exactly what it is. But then it it's that's how, uh, as a nation, we sort of start to think about these events, uh, and rather than those longer term social policy uh, actions that would really uh, sort of prevent those communities being so vulnerable in the first instance. So for us in those disaster relief discussions to be saying. Yep, but uh, and bringing in the the wider determinants would be a, a great interim. So, Selena, or oh, sorry, Rangina. I just wanted to um, put a few things, you know, together. One is, I think the reason why the national government can step back and the local government can't is because the closer you get to the problem, the more invested you are in the people. And it's very easy to just say, oh, that's someone else's problem when you don't know the actual people that have been involved. So the closer you are to the community, the more the community will help those people. So when we had floods, you know, there's a massive community support and so on. So I think it's not just about a whole city doing it because there'll always be pockets within a city that don't get the benefit. But it's about all of us within our own communities finding the ways to fill all of the, the gaps, as Taran said. And, you know, like... What you just said, instead of an alarmist approach, it's more about, okay, think about the rebuild that needs to happen. And when you think about rebuild, then you think, well, what's the gap we need to rebuild? And how are we in our own local community able to make our little bit of difference to rebuild? So I think that's where it has to be and not sort of think, well, it's someone else's problem. <laughs> because it's easy to say that when you don't know people. I think we're running out of time, but Selena, and I just want to give you 30 seconds to comment if you can, so hopefully. Um, yeah, I, I thank you. Um, I think the Academy would be um, wise to think about your legacy for the next five, 10 years, what um, this gentleman said there. And um, in terms of um, opportunity, in fact, the Alliance is going to um, have Anders Nordstrom here next next year he um, led this piece of work called healthy societies healthy population which michael marmot actually was part of and much of that is about um, social determinants so just one opportunity would be to see if people from the academy would like to have a conversation um, with that group um, when they come to visit um, as as just an, um, a point where the global would meet uh, local for discussion um, and one last thing, resources, I'll just put it out there, whether I know everybody has um, issues with them, resource for research, but Global Health Research resource for research is um, incredibly underfunded in this country compared to other OECD countries. We'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. Taryn. Taryn. I think part of the trick is to do, to do what you may do in a laboratory, which is have a, a process, a really good process for inclusion and discussion and participation. So that's kind of the voice and listening truly to everybody in a team or in a society. Creating a just process is more likely to lead to just outcomes. You may not know where you're going to get to, but we heard that yesterday. I think the last two days for me has been a really inclusive, important conversation, which I've learned a lot of. I think the Academy has got a unique value proposition to set up, otherwise you wouldn't have set yourself, wouldn't have set up. So using that unique value proposition to do something uniquely that only you can do mm. is, is the challenge I'd give you. Because as individuals, there's something each of us can do that no one else can do. And as organizations, there's something we can do that no one else can do. Thank you. So I think it's been a really, really informative panel discussion. I think it's really obvious that there is a lot that we potentially can do as the Academy. Um, and I think, you know, reflecting on Sir Michael's talks and in particular the lessons that could be applied to Australia is something we could do. And I know Louise, our incoming president, had some thoughts that she was going to be conveying. And um, so um, I think we'll draw it to conclusion and say thank you very much now. But as an academy, I think that, you know, this potentially is an area we really could be just pulling together something and getting our thoughts down. So I'd encourage all the members just to 
contribute to email, I don't know how we do this, but to the Secretariat, I guess, if there's anything. Yeah, Claire, Secretariat, Claire, <laughs> wonderful. So, yeah, thank you very much. But thank, please join me in thanking the speakers. Thank you very much.